All right, our next guest is a staple on ESPN. You see him as an analyst. You see him as a scout. You see him as a sideline reporter in the booth. You name it. You can hear him on Sirius XM Radio as well. I hear him all the time. Uh, let's talk to Tom Luganville here with us on Up to the Second College Football. Tom, how are you, sir? I'm doing good, man. Hope you're doing well. Uh, I appreciate your time. So, uh, I'll, yeah, we cover A and M here a lot. So let's just start things off with A and M. Your assessment of a team that's been in the middle of these games with a chance to win against Bama and a chance to win against Tennessee, but it doesn't matter. Chance to win and not win uh, makes the program feel like it hasn't taken that step it expected to take this year. Yeah, and I think you know, first of all, the buy came at the perfect time. But I also believe that when you lose a quarterback. And then you go into a schedule where two weeks in a row, it's, you know, it's Alabama. Then it's on the road at Tennessee. You do end up having some injuries as well. You're a little bit banged up um, at the wide receiver position. Max Johnson's trying to do, you know, what he can do to continue to, to grow and mature as an offense. Because I like, I, I felt, you know, leading in to the Alabama game and really, you know, you know, up until Connor Wigman got hurt, this is an offense that made a lot of strides. You know, we're seeing explosive plays. Um, we're seeing a team that was very, very difficult to defend. They had an identity. You could see the ball being pushed downfield. And I just think they kind of took a bit of a kick to the gut a little bit. Um, the defense has been outstanding outside of Tennessee. Nobody's been able to run on this football team. And I think the players on that side of the ball are starting to come to fruition as far as, you know, equating their production to, to what they were coming out as highly touted recruits. And so, you know, having a bye week and then South Carolina at home is probably the perfect recipe right now. Um, and especially when you start, to, I'm not a huge stat guy unless they, have, you know, their stats like third or, third down conversion and turnover margin and all those sorts of things. But you look at the areas where South Carolina is really struggling. You look at the areas where Texas A&M has played actually really well, and it doesn't match up and bode well for South Carolina. So um, the question is, can you get back on the winning side? Can you start to gain some confidence? Can the little things start to come together? I, I think, you know, we, we always talk about, oh, well, you know, you missed that play or you missed this and that. And then sometimes we gloss over the fact that a technique or a fundamental, something that's this small that magnifies and turns to, into a big deal, those are the things that you go back to during your bye week. And it's those little itty bitty details that as you stack them on top of each other, become game winning or game losing type of situations. And I think that's where Texas A&M has got to start somehow coming out on the winning end on those little things. Tom, uh, how about Alabama? Uh, the, the season felt like it was going to go one direction. People say they're going to be a three loss yeah. team. And, and look, they, there's still a lot of SEC play left, but they have redefined sure. their season. And how have they done it? <laughs> you know, I had their game against uh, Arkansas two weeks ago. And coming off of that game and then, you know, watching them, you know, particularly in the second half with, with Tennessee, it's, it's interesting to me. I said this to somebody earlier in the weekend. Somehow Nick Saban has managed to be the 800-pound gorilla in the room and at the same time be the underdog. Like, <laughs> and that's hard to do, right? And that's kind of who they are. They're still Alabama, so there's that element of dominance. And at times we've seen it particularly on defense. They've been fantastic on defense. And then there's other times where you're just like, they're the little engine that could. They're trying to figure out how to just get a first down. And you find yourself rooting for like just something that moves the chain, something in the run game. I, I think what's happened is they're just good enough in some areas to stay in the game. The defense is outstanding. They're heavily penalized every week. I mean, it's you know, it, it's been mind boggling. And then you guys know with the Texas A&M game, you go on the road, you commit 14 penalties and you somehow win the game. And I think that only happens when your talent is, is so good, which it is at Alabama, that you can get away with some things, not all the time, but they've managed to do that. The, the quarterback, I think what we see on offense with Alabama, the quarterback is what he is. He's not changing. Um, it's a work in progress. They're always going to look out of sorts. And then at other times, they're going to look really, really good. They're going to have moments where they'll go one for nine in the passing game. And then for the next two series, so a 46-yard bomb and a 72-yard bomb, both resulting in touchdowns. It's what they are. And so can they keep riding the lightning in that regard? Can they keep winning? Um, what if they got in a track meet against LSU? I know that game's going to be at home for Alabama, but there's still a lot of questions out there. 
But I remember coming off of our broadcast and my partner, Dave Pash and Dusty Dvorak, and we're in the car heading back to Birmingham to get on a flight. And we all kind of looked at each other and said, you know what? This Alabama team is somehow going to screw around and find itself in the college football playoff. I don't know how, and I don't know why, and it probably shouldn't happen, but it wouldn't surprise any of us. So through eight weeks of, of games and, you know, bye week for many, who do you think is the best team in college football just from the eyeball test? The eyeball test is to Michigan. Um, the problem is we haven't had to see them go through what Ohio State's gone through. We haven't had to see them um, go and, and play an Oregon-Washington type game. Uh, those types of things are only going to come probably twice based off of what your assessment is of Penn State and their outing versus Ohio State. But you're going to have Michigan-Ohio State and Michigan-Penn State and really the only two teams that will challenge them. But offense, defense, kicking game, scouting, haha, just joking. Um, they are they're really good, and they're good in all of the championship areas. When I, when I say that, championship teams are built from the inside out. In the offensive front, the defensive front, the quarterback's playing better than he ever has. And then they've got the other components to make plays, but no, nobody has put them in a hole. Nobody's been able to challenge them athletically and see what they do when things aren't going their way. They've been able to dictate terms to every opponent they played um, to this point. And, and I say that about Michigan, but then I look across the rest of the country. I've seen Florida state in person. I've seen Clemson in person. Uh, I had an opportunity. I've seen Texas. I'm going to see Texas again this week, obviously without Quinn Ewers. Um, but I do think there's five or six teams that are, that are all college football playoff worthy, Ohio state, Washington, Oregon, even with the loss is, is a, uh, is a college football playoff uh, caliber team. So they're out there. We just got to see how they all kind of filter through once we go down the next four to five weeks of the season. Tom, do you think the sign stealing scandal can affect them, you know, off the field, on the field, and, and will it cost them a chance? Depending on what's revealed, I absolutely do. Until we know the totality of that, um, until we gather all of the information on just how deep if at all, this thing goes, how intricate it is, how diabolical it is being made out to be. If that comes to fruition, yeah, I do. I think, I, I think it could be a real, real problem. Because listen, you know, and I spent almost 11 years of my life in the coaching profession before moving into scouting. And, and, and we've all been a part of, you know, scouting in-house and preparing for an opponent and breaking down the film. And looking at the hash mark and the line to gain and the area of the field and the down and distance and all of those different things. And, you know, sign stealing in game, that's kind of part of it. You deal with that. Guys are going to do it. Some guys aren't going to do it. Some people are heavily invested in it. It's part of it. But what's being alleged here is different because I think what's being alleged here is an advanced scouting element of a team or teams that you may not play for two to three to four weeks and you're gathering all of the intel on signals and how they're putting things into the game, and then you have that time to match that up with the game film for every single play for maybe two to three to four weeks prior to ever even playing that opponent. That's a whole different level, in, in my opinion. And um, it's unfortunate. And if any of that stuff does come to fruition, like I said, yeah, I think it could have a severe impact. Florida, Georgia. Look, I thought Florida was going to be a joke this year. They've they've turned their season into something. Georgia <laughs> has unbelievable. Yeah, it's been great to watch for Billy Napier. Georgia hasn't been the Georgia, but they're still undefeated. They're still Georgia. So, how do you see mm -hmm. this weekend playing out? You know, it's interesting you say that about Florida because I said to somebody the other day, I said, "You know, Florida's five and two, and they're like, "What? <laughs> Florida's five and two? What?" I said, "I know it's crazy." I just said, "Even crazier is Graham Mertz is playing like he's got an S on his chest," and so. I think Florida's got some confidence. Do I think they're the better team? Obviously not. Um, I do think they feel better about themselves. They know a little bit more about who they are. The outside of the Kentucky game on the ground, all right, they've they've played improved football. They're starting to kind of get a feel for themselves. You know, it, it's going to be interesting because I think everybody's looking at this being the first game for Georgia without Brock Bowers. And, you know, what will Georgia do? I, the Georgia-Kentucky game was a, a real indicator for me in terms of Georgia's growth in the passing game. Because if you recall, Carson Beck did a really good job of, of locating Ra Ra Thomas and taking chances with him. And the same thing with Marcus Roseme, Jack Saint, hitting him and finding other areas, going through progressions where it wasn't all about 
Brock Bowers. Because the thing with Brock Bowers is, as a quarterback, even when he's covered, he's really not covered. So your your tendency is to kind of give him that last look for that last second when normally your progression should tell you to get to here or get to here. And I think we saw some some promise in that in regards to George's uh, offense. So I do think they will have other compliments and they will be fine. Um, wouldn't be surprised if this is a, a close game going into half. But then at the, at the end of the day, I think Georgia will pull away. You know, this schedule that everybody's, you know, quote unquote, made fun of with Georgia is all of a sudden down the stretch uh, looking a little bit more competitive. And so um, here we go. Who can stay healthy? Who's who makes plays? Who doesn't get tired? Who doesn't get worn out? Most importantly, who prepares to go out each and every week? Because we're seeing in college football right now, if you're not prepared to play, you're going to get beat. Tom, let's close out with this one. Ole Miss, do you buy them the season that they're having and, and, and can they maintain where they are for the rest of the year? I, I buy them when they're healthy. And right now they're healthy. And I say that because our crew had them early on. I want to say it was week two against Tulane, week two or three. Um, and they were not healthy. Trey Harris had been injured. Quinshawn Judkins was on kind of one leg and they could not run the ball at all that day. Tulane probably should have won the game. Tulane really beat them up up front. And then what Tulane was able to do on that day, and this is my take on Ole Miss. When Ole Miss can't dictate terms to the defense, meaning that they can't go at lightning speed, they're a different team. And Tulane got them off schedule. So now all of a sudden they're playing slower and they're not themselves. No Trey Harris on that day. Again, Quinshawn Judkins was not available. You look at this offense with those two guys healthy and the progress Jackson Dart has made, I think they're just good enough on defense because they're capable of getting in a scoring race with anybody and being there in the last possession. So am I buying them? Yes, I'm buying them. The fact they got past LSU is a big deal. Um, And we'll see what kind of mess they can make of the SEC West down the stretch. Tom Luganville, thanks so much for your time, sir. We'll do it again, all right? You bet. Thanks for having me.